You're listening to the Missionary Perspective Podcast with veteran missionaries Eric Johnson and Joshua Mead. We're glad you could join us. We trust this podcast will be both a blessing and a challenge as we relate topics in world evangelism from a missionary perspective. Now, here's Josh and Eric. Well, good morning, Josh. How are you guys doing there in sunny West Senegal, Africa? We're doing great. We uh, The cold weather has finally come back, and so we're enjoying that a little bit. And uh, we just, our crates came in a couple of weeks ago, so we're still organizing all that. I just got our bedroom redone. I'm painting our bathroom, and uh, Julie's putting me to work here. And so with all the stuff we brought over to decorate and get things set up, but I've also got... Uh, all my new equipment for our studio. I've got two microphones now, a church in Michigan that my cousin pastors uh, donated the funds to get these uh, really nice cameras. I've got, uh, I can't turn the camera right now, but I've got a couple of lights set up, um, overhead light, uh, just a whole bunch of equipment set up. And so we're excited uh, to to be using that now with our ministry and with the uh, online ministry. We're also about to enter into, there's a new Christian TV station that's opening up in the Capitol, and we're going to be providing some programming for the uh, TV station. Excellent. Well, Josh has some really nice equipment. I sound like I'm talking in a tin can, so that's the difference there, listener. Josh knows what he's doing, and I don't. But uh, speaking about knowing what we're doing, this is one of the podcasts I've been looking forward to that uh, I just think it's going to be a fun one. I think I'll, this might actually be one of the ones, one of the podcasts that might be interest the most amount of people who might listen because it doesn't necessarily have to deal with being a missionary. It's really do- dealing with missionary biographies, missionary books uh, that have influenced us uh, throughout our time as Christians. And I'm looking forward to kind of just talking a little bit about the different kinds of resources we've come across over the years and how they've been a blessing to us. We've also, as a few weeks ago, put a message asking our listeners to respond to some missionary books that have impacted their lives. It didn't have to be to just missionaries. And so we got a great amount of responses with some terrific books, many that I haven't even read that I'm looking forward to reading. So, but before we get to that, Josh, I have some questions, kind of just to start, maybe if you can remember your earliest memory of maybe um, reading a missionary biography or uh, your encounter, understanding what a missionary is and reading it maybe in a young reader book and how you may have responded or reacted to that as a young person. Yeah, all of the missionary interaction that I had when I was young was either through missionaries coming to my grandfather's church and giving updates or it was uh, through Sunday school teachers or junior church teachers telling those little, either the Betty Lucan uh, flannel graph or the little car- the stories. My grandma would actually do vacation Bible school, and she would always have a missionary story that she would tell at the end and uh, talk about. So that was the first exposure to missionaries, mission work. Um, but after God called me to be a missionary when I was 13, my mom gave me a biography on the life of Jim L. Uh, and those five guys that gave their lives to reach the Aka Indians, and so that that had a big impact on me. I I'm I have a flair for the dramatic. I, I love good storytelling, and of course, um, there is there is a romance to missions. Okay, to foreign missions in general. You know, growing up, my favorite movie was Lawrence of Arabia. Who doesn't like Indiana Jones? All those movies where they're going to exotic locations. And so when you are called to be a missionary, you kind of have that mindset that, uh, man, I'm going to go to exotic locations and I'm going to have all these adventures. And then when you read missionary biographies, uh, majority of the biographies are highlighting all the ups and uh, some of the downs of the uh, of the missionary life, what they don't record is all the plateaus of the missionary life. I try to tell people, when you read a missionary biography, remember, that's only about 10 or 15% of their life. The rest of it is just mundane monotony of everyday things. But Jim Elliott was one of the first ones I read and uh, had a great impact. He was a, a 
just very discerning young man uh, when he was at college, just the stories of his passion and his zeal and how the five guys banded together and uh, did everything they could to attempt to contact and reach the Aki Indians. It inspired me when I was a teenager to take pilot's lessons. Uh, I would try to, I wanted to learn how to fly. I wanted to learn how to, uh, uh, you know, I thought I'd be a jungle pilot in Africa somewhere. And so that was the beginning. Uh, I think the next book I read, I went to Bill Rice Ranch and I bought the book Cowboy Boots in Darkest Africa uh, by the original Bill Rice, uh, you know, the first. And so he had all kinds of stories of him going to jungles of Africa. Uh, he was a big burly cowboy evangelist from the States. And uh, he had all these adventures in his travels through Africa that he had made. And so that that had an impact. Another uh, missionary biography I read as a teenager was John Stamm, uh, missionary to China, and how he gave his life. Uh, not just the years of his life ministering, but also was a martyr for Christ and the work there in China. I also did a reader's theater and I played Jim Elliott and I played John Stamm, both in high school and in our church youth group. And uh, after I played both roles, my mom said, Josh, please stop playing roles where the missionary dies. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want you to, I don't like that idea. You know, you're going to be a missionary. You keep playing these uh playing these roles where the guy dies. But anyways, those, those were the, the books, I would say, during high school when God called me that had the biggest impact. How about you? What are some books that either before you felt led to be a missionary, when you were called, what were some biographies that impacted you? So it's interesting as we kind of came up with this concept, you know, a lot of times we're talking about how maybe we're at a, uh, a revival meeting, the Lord called us into missions, or we went on a missions trip. But you really, I spoke to a lot of my friends. They were influenced by books and missionaries about becoming a missionary. So that's why I thought this topic would be important. And so for me, just like you, the first biography I remember reading was the biography of Jim Elliott. Now, this was probably more of a young readers kind of, probably right, about right. eight, nine, 10 years old. But, you know, even though they probably didn't leave, they didn't put all the details in, I got the uh, the gist of the story. I ascertained what happened to these men. And, you know, due to the dramatic and tragic and inspirational nature of the story, I think my mind was formed in thinking that, you know, being a missionary was very, very, very dangerous. And also that, you know, with a passion of, of young Jim Elliott in college, it was very evident. I think I kind of had this idea that really the only the Navy SEALs of Christians became missionaries. You know, right. you, you really had to be this, this special class of missionary to be a, 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 a Christian, to be a missionary. And so maybe due to that fact, and maybe possibly because the church I grew up in, at least to my knowledge that I remember, didn't really emphasize missions or missionaries so much. I'm sure we supported missionaries, but the idea of becoming a missionary just wasn't something that was on the on the forefront. That these these missionary stories they they had a great impression on me, but boy, it was like they were at such a level that I mean I never even considered it because I mean those guys they all die right. I mean you go, <laughs> you go be a missionary they all die, and so that was my first impression, and so that kind of leads me into this is kind of the same kind of story, uh, same kind of question, Josh, but. Were there books as you maybe started feeling the call to be a missionary, maybe that helped to reaffirm your call to be a missionary uh, that maybe said, yeah, this is definitely the direction I want to go. As you mentioned, being part of, you know, um, readers, theaters, and, and the more you learn about missionaries, were there books that as you understood more about missions and say, hey, yeah, that's definitely what I want to do. Yeah, definitely. Um Leading up to going to Bible college, um, my senior year, I we did a college tour, different colleges. One of the colleges that we visited with our youth group, uh, there was a missionary there by the name of Daryl Champlin, and he was preaching in the chapel. And he uh, had some cassette tapes. That was back when cassette tapes were still a thing, you know, <laughs> that you could use and buy. And so I, I picked up one of his cassette tapes and the title of his message is called Afraid of What? I still have that cassette tape. I probably listened to it uh, 100, 200 times um, that la my senior year. And it really helped to form kind of my, my passion and zeal my desire of where I would go. It kind of helped form the idea of being a pioneer missionary uh, in a place where there's 
few to no, uh, you know, missionary presence where there's little missionary presence. And so, um, going into college, once I got to college, um, some of the books that really helped shape, um, and I think this goes in, I think you had two questions there. One was books that help kind of understanding missions and then books that you read in college and stuff. Um, I would say our college classes, there's, you know, some of the Herbert Kane, I think his name is, uh, he's got philosophy missions, just some basic missions books. Those of course are going to help, you know, kind of form a theology of missions overall. Um, you can't go wrong with the book of Acts. And I think it's going to be assumed here that the Bible is your number one textbook uh, takeaway, but there's definitely other books that are going to be supplemental and great help. One of the books that really helped influence and impact my prayer life going into missions was a book uh, called Praying Hide. And I can't I don't remember who the author was, but it was just basically a biography of the life of this guy named Hyde. I can't even remember his first name. It's been a while since I read it. But uh, I remember as a freshman in college, the impact that this book had on how essential prayer was to the impact of this missionary. I think he was in India. And um, and then just reading other books about other men, uh, William Carey and, and Henry Martin and others who, uh, Adam Nine Judson, who's prayer life played such a big role in the mission work. And so any book, uh, there's a book called By My Spirit, any book you can find about Jonathan Goforth, uh, Jonathan Goforth's wife wrote a um, book as well. Anything by them is just, it's excellent. It really emphasizes the how essential prayer is. If you can get your hands on any book, and that's not just for missionary, that that's for just uh, Christian life in general. Learn to cultivate a prayer life um, because for the Christian, and this was a discussion I was having with some Muslims the other day about prayer um, for in Islam, you have a formula for prayer, okay? You have the way you're supposed to pray, your posture, the way you bow, the words you repeat. There's an entire structure to it. And once you learn that, prayer is pretty easy. For the Christian, there's no command about how your posture is supposed to be, where, how you're supposed to stand, are you supposed to kneel, what are you supposed to pray, this and that. Uh, the Bible gives outlines, it gives instruction on how to begin a prayer life, but it's relationship building with the Lord Jesus Christ is how you develop that prayer life. And so get your hands on books uh, about prayer and find books by missionaries who understood the importance of prayer. But those are a couple books, uh, you know, that really made a big, big impact on uh, missions, praying hide. Um, and then for church planning, I've mentioned it before in the past, Organic Church. I forgot to write down the author's name. Um, that was a book that uh, obviously I'm not 100% on everything he wrote or his whole approach, but it helped plant a seed in my mind for breaking the church down to its core elements of just the gospel and prayer, and then moving forward from that to let the church grow. And then the last one I would say that had a big impact on kind of shaping my mentality going into Islamic evangelism is a book called uh, Planting Churches in Muslim Cities by a uh, guy named Craig Greg Livingston. And um, excellent, well-written book, well thought out. Um, and he just gives kind of a historical approach, some of the failures and successes of the past, some mindsets that people have about Islamic evangelism that need to be kind of nixed, and then how you should approach Islamic evangelism. Um, so those are kind of three major books that came to mind when you uh, posed that question. How about you? What are some books that um, really helped you to lay a foundation and groundwork for going into missions, kind of missions in general, mission specific? So as I grew up and understood what a missionary was a little bit more, um, I guess probably in my adolescence, my young, being a young person, I came across the books of Elizabeth Elliot, uh, Through the Gates of Splendor and Shadow of the Almighty. I can't honestly remember which one I read first, but I do remember reading both. And I think because it came from her and her able to remember not only the life of Jim Elliot, but their life together, their, their passion to serve the Lord, their passion for each other, um, th those were really 
those are really important. I, I think I really connect with missionary biographies because maybe you know Josh is Josh knew that he wanted to be a missionary, so he was checking a lot of the nuts and bolts about how to be a missionary. I think I was very interested in the kind of what made them tick, why why they had made that decision to be a missionary, what it would take mentally, emotionally, spiritually to 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 want to be a missionary and then to be a missionary. And so I think it always fascinated me when I was a young person. Another thing I remember seeing as a young man was the movie Chariots of Fire and never hearing who Eric Little was. And so I, because I was so involved and loved sports, I said, you know, who is this guy? And then so for those of you who don't know about Eric Little, or more than what you've seen in the movie Chariots of Fire, uh, you know, Eric Little was born on the mission field. He was born in China to missionary parents. And then it was the custom of the day then for the children to come home to boarding school. And he you know, grew up at a younger, maybe, uh, I think he was a young, maybe 10, 12, 11, something like that, till he was an adult. He grew up in England and boarding school was a great athlete. And famously, if you don't know the story of Chariots of Fire, wouldn't run on Sunday um, and ran in a different race and won a gold medal, won a couple of medals in the 1924 Olympics. But really after that, uh, the rest of the Eric Little story is still very amazing and how he went back to China and how he was a terrific missionary who unfortunately had a brain tumor while he was uh, in a Japanese concentration camp in China. And right before the end of World War II, passed away. But there are some terrific books that I got a hold of as a young man and just thought it was fascinating how yet the world concentrated on this, this conviction of this man not to run on Sunday. Right. And yet the world, if he never was an athlete, would never know how good of a missionary he was. And so those are kind of the stories that I think made me want to wonder, what is it like to be a missionary? And so there was that a, mind, I, I, if I could just, I'll just mention a mm-hmm. yeah, friend of mine that friend of mine that I went to Bible college with his pastor's wife uh, out in uh, British Columbia, his pastor's wife mm-hmm. was a little uh, missionary kid uh, in China. And she was interned with her family in the same prison camp that Eric Little was in. Mm. And she said he was the kindest wow. guy. He would, um, they all he say. would always, always play with the kids. And she, she said he was just a great guy. Him Uncle he Eric. It, <laughs> yeah. He kept everybody's spirits up and everything during the mm-hmm. time there. But anyways, I was really neat when I, I found that out about. Uh, well, and that's, that's in the, I'll talk about a little later on how our lives have sometimes been able to intersect with these, these stories like that. And so uh, just real quickly, the name of those books that I read in the last number of years and as the adolescent, one of them was called for the glory, Eric Little's journey from Olympic champion to modern martyr by Duncan Hamilton. Another one's called Eric Little, pure gold, the Olympic champion who inspired chariots of fire by David uh, McCausland. Uh, a wonderful story. Someone, I think there's a world focus on one thing. And yes, as believers, they understand there's way, way more to that. So this let's dive a little deep. And that transitions to kind of a question. I guess it's kind of the same. But this, Josh, is more like, all right, now you're you're done with Bible college. You're becoming a missionary. Maybe you're in pre-field ministry. Um, some of the books that you might have read um, that you kind of prepared your heart for. And, and I'm, I'm just going to start with one of mine because this one to me uh, was – one that I remember being, reading at the end of Bible college, and maybe you've read this, it's called In the Presence of My Enemies mm-hmm. from Gracia Burnham. Uh, it's the, the gripping account of her and her husband and a number of other missionaries who were kidnapped. This was recently, this was in early 2000s. Um, and then, you know, just a terror going through a kidnapping. Yeah, but the story is, you know, they she weaves the story of their biography and their mission life through this. And, you know, what really gripped me was the strength of will, and yet the Christ like in dwelling of grace that must have been in her to live through this ordeal. Uh, it, it really helped me as I was preparing to go to the mission field to understand the mental, physical, emotion, and spiritual fortitude that was necessary to go through these kinds of hardships. This wasn't a story from 75 years ago during World War II. This was very contemporary. And uh, yet the love that she had not only for Christ, but her captors, um, the wave of emotions that allowed me to think, you know, do I love anyone in my own family like this, that, that they were doing these kinds of things, let alone my neighborhood or or enemies, if you will. And so this really helped calibrate my thinking long before landing on the mission field, um, the kind of really toughness that it would take to be a missionary. I think that really helped me in my mindset. So I don't know if there's something like more contemporary that you've read 
uh, of a biography that's that's helped you uh, um, maybe prepare for the mission field or when you recently arrived in the mission field? Yeah, um, you know, as I was preparing, um, Charles Keene would come to our church every once in a while. He had a he had a good book called Thinking Outside the Box that just kind of helped. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just kind of gave a good uh, gave an idea of uh, just kind of getting your mindset ready for the mission field. I think one thing that's important is that you learn. And I always try to tell, I tried to tell one of my friends this because he wanted to do, he wanted to be a missionary, but he wanted, he read the book Thinking Outside the Box and he wanted to just throw the box away. He wanted everything to be done radically different. And I tried to explain, I, I think the point of that book is, and the point of the box is the box is not a bad thing. Like structure is not bad. You need to have a good structure down. But sometimes when the structure keeps you from fulfilling God's will, then you need to be willing to step outside of that box. But don't, but don't throw away the box. Like you need, you need the discipline of a structure. And so one of the books, and it's not a modern book, but it's a, it's, it was an unusual book that radically impacted when I was a freshman in college, it radically impacted how I comprehended what it meant to be a vessel for the Lord, for him to use. And it was the book called The Art of War by Sun Tzu, okay? That is old book on warfare and all that. And as I'm reading it, different war strategy and philosophy and all that, one of the statements that gripped me that really, I mean, it, it radically changed my understanding of what I am as a servant of God and really it just opened up a lot of understanding of scriptures. It was a statement in it. He says, it is not the cup that holds the water, okay? And maybe it's just high verbal here, but he said, it's not the cup that holds the water. It's the hollow in the cup that holds the water. He said, therefore, usefulness arises not out of what is, but what is not. And I thought, like, is he just throwing around words there? Of course, the cup holds the water. But the point is, the deeper the hollow in the cup, the greater the the, the cup can hold, the, the capacity to hold and be useful. If I have stuff in that cup, I can't hold water, and therefore I'm not useful. And I realize at that moment, it's not who I am that is going to give God glory. It's, it's what I'm not, it's what I give to God. It's who God is through me. I, I have to empty myself of myself and be totally thrown onto God and his will and trusting him. And, um, it was at that moment that I just really realized that I, I have to let God's word shape me. I have to let godly people shape me and, and I have to read good books and be influenced by good preaching and, and uh, have good mentors. And so, um, and then there were other things in that book that kind of helped just kind of figuring out strategy. You know, the apostle Paul says that we're not ignorant of the devices of Satan. And so I would, I'll read sometimes books on warfare. I like to read history books, anything on World War II. I, I love reading the history of World War II and just different stories coming out of that. And so not only missionary biographies, but reading stories of war heroes, reading stories of strategy and things like that. Uh, those have also been helpful. Um, but as for missionary biographies, I really haven't sat down and read a biography in a while. Last year, I was working through a, a biography by William Carey's son uh, or grandson. I can't think which one it is S. Pierce Carey. And then um, I was also reading through a book that James Ray, the former president of BIMI, he has some ex excellent books on missions history. Um, look it up on BIMI. I think you can find the resources there. He's written a couple of great books on not only the history of BIMI, but he's written uh, just some great short uh, biographies about different missionaries. I, I gave a copy to my grandma. She loves it. You can sit down and read about a missionary in the past, you know, in a setting and uh, it's re really well written. And so those are some of the uh, biographies kind of currently that I have read in the past. But mm -hmm. So I've kind of saved my very favorite one for last. And this is the one I just wanted to spend a few minutes on. Um, I think we all probably have certain books that resonate 
with us more especially than others. I first remember reading this book when I was on an internship here in the Dominican. And then over the years, I'll pick it up and read it again because for me and how it's touched my life, it's the best um, missionary biography that has um, just really helped me understand a lot of things about missions without maybe even this author understanding what they were even writing. So the name of this book is called Mission to the Headhunters, How God's Forgiveness Transformed Tribal Enemies. It's by Frank Drown, Frank and Marie Drown. Now, if you will, just give me a second to explain who these people were. Frank and Marie Drown were missionaries for 37 years in the jungles of Ecuador. They were basically contemporaries of Jim and Elizabeth Elliot, Nate Saint. Uh, they were very close. In fact, Frank was asked to lead the expedition to find uh, the missionaries and, and ultimately did at their deaths. He actually, he and his wife entered the jungle slightly uh, a little bit before, right after World War II. And so uh, I could spend the entire episode on this book. And in fact, I have something in the back of my mind that I'm working on that we may uh, do down the road, but I won't mention that right now. But they had an amazing run of 37 years in the jungle. And so what did I love about this book? Well, I'm going to elaborate a few things. They're not in specific priority order, but I think they're just kind of how they came to me. The first thing that I loved about this book is that when you read this account of Frank's, um, you see how the Lord truly worked in their ministry and the deepest, darkest parts of, of Ecuador. You have to understand this. This was, like I said, right after World War II. So you can imagine how rustic and you know, without convenience this would have been. Uh, so you really see their dedication to you know, real hardship, real trials. We talk about that a lot. But, you know, one of the things Josh was talking about is that most missionary books don't talk a lot about the mundane everyday life. And this one really did. Uh, Frank really has a very simple writing style. Uh, his memory, which this had to be decades later, was amazing. And how astounding that he can remember certain days and, and just the arduous journey that you would see and yet how, unless you've lived on the mission field and gone through weeks of just like Josh talked about plateaus and not high, high highs or even lows, this book really does this. And, and so you have to sit into it and, and, and realize it's a long ride, but it's really good because of that. If you want to understand what everyday missions life is like and Really, I say like you have to have that marathon view instead of the sprint. And this book for the first time for me and then years later reading other books really did it the best that I've ever seen. And so it really resonated with me. And another aspect, and I think it's very interesting that both Josh and I talk about how important the life of Jim Elliott was in our lives as future missionaries. And I would say millions of others. Frank never mentions this, but this is just kind of this was the first thing that really blared to me as I read this is that this is or would have been the biography of Jim and Elizabeth Elliot if Jim hadn't died. This is what Jim Elliot would have done for 37 years if he stayed in the jungle. And so it's not Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. They had a different life. You know, the Lord had in his sovereignty had a different will. And, you know, Jim's story is inspirational and it's sacrificial and it impacts millions. Frank's doesn't have that for the same scope of people. But for me, it is as a missionary who doesn't want to end up like Jim Elliott, I realize how important uh, this book is for just everyday missions, for people who want to know what it's like to be a missionary. Obviously, this is 75 years ago, many 70 years ago. and But it really helps understand the perspective that you should have as a missionary. And so one of the things I want to say is that um, it, it is literally my favorite missions book, and I highly recommend it. Uh, Frank and his wife both have passed on in the last few years, um, but their memory lives on in this this book. And as Josh was mentioning, somehow coming in contact with someone who knew um, Eric Little in the concentration camp. So I think it was in 2006, right before I went to the mission field or we went on deputation. Um, I have this habit sometimes of trying to look people up. My wife calls me Sherlock. If I want to know something or somebody, a lot of times I'll try. And I found Frank Drown was still alive and found his number. He was living in the Midwest. And so I just back back in the day, you could kind of look up in the yellow pages online. And I started calling and I said, is it I called this number? I said, is this Frank Drown, the former missionary? And he, he was very old. He said, yeah, yes, it is. And so I told him who I was and read his book and how important it was to me. And I just said, I'm going to be a missionary. 
Um, Brother Drown, is there something, some advice you could give me, some encouragement, something you've learned over the years? And, you know, he was very old. I didn't want to take a lot of his time up, but he said, you know, there's two things I tell every missionary. He said, love God, love the people, you know? And I just thought how that was so typical. If you read this book, how the simplicity of this, this missionary, how he lived his life. And I, I'm going to tell you, they did things in the jungle. You're just not going to believe it. I'm not going to spoil the book. Um, but it only came through years and years and years of hard work, seeing sometimes very little uh, fruit that when at the end of their life, they could look back and just see the amazing things the Lord did. So it's called Mission to the Headhunters, um, How God's Forgiveness Transformed Tribal Enemies. And I couldn't recommend it highly enough. Uh, if you want to learn the essence of what it is to uh, live the mundane, difficult, sometimes difficult, wonderful stories of a missionary. Uh, this is this is a book that resonates to me. That even today, I was rereading it, kind of getting ready for this podcast uh, a few, actually a few days ago, and it was talking about a time where they had a setback in the ministry, and they they didn't know what was going to happen, so they just decided, you know, I think their kid's birthday was coming up. They said, we're just going to. We can't do anything about tomorrow. We're going to do about something about today. We're going to have the best birthday we possibly can in the jungle for this kid. And if you're a missionary, you understand sometimes you, you, you have all kinds of problems on the horizon. You don't know how they're going to work out. But for your kid's sake, for your sanity's sake, sometimes you just got to go have that birthday party and make it a big day. And so I could not highly recommend this book enough. Mission to the Hunters by Frank Drown. Excellent. I'm going to be looking that up. What do you do? And I'll... I'll share a couple of my books, but I wanted to ask you this question. What, what do you do for, uh, you know, you're in the Dominican Republic. Uh, do you collect books when you're in the States? Do you bring them with you? Do you have books shipped to you? Do you use any online resources? How do you get access to new books? If you hear about a good book? Well, I'm, I'm going to say this is probably, I think it's five years, but it's probably closer to 10 years. I stopped trying to buy physical books because my house just doesn't have the space. I don't have the shelf space. I, I built a church and I do actually have more room in the church, but I shouldn't do that because it's mostly a lot of times those books are in English. So I right. try to buy as much digital as possible. It just makes good sense to me. I also don't have necessarily the greatest eyesight. And so it's sometimes lighting's not their best. So backlit tablets are way better for me to read anyway. So, uh, yeah, I go digitally. Uh, if someone hands me a book, obviously I want to take it and, you know, go yeah, read yeah. It and keep it. Uh, but I'm trying more than ever to be digital. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I like using Kindle, um, digital books, uh, audible has been great. I've really enjoyed that. I can, while I'm working painting, yeah, that's definitely worth the investment. I think it's like 15 bucks a month, but you get three credits per month. Yeah. Yep. Audible's excellent. And then I, I want to share this little secret. Uh, this is for the missionary or evangelist who's traveling. Okay. This is how I collected. I collected hundreds of books for about 50 cents a book, 50 cents to a dollar a book. Every time you're traveling, especially if you're a missionary, if you're at a new church in a new town, find the goodwill in town and go straight to the book section. You never know what you're gonna find. We found, we went to one Goodwill and a pastor had just passed away and his widow brought all of his books there and they had just put them up. I bought every one there. And so you just, you never know what you're gonna find. So I, I have hundreds of books. I have a little Goodwill sticker on them. Uh, great theology books, you know, biographies, just you never know what you're gonna find. And so um, just giving a little tip out there. But uh, yeah, definitely uh, online resources, Audible, a lot of different things out there. Books that, um, that, have impacted me. I already mentioned, you know, for church planting, uh, the planting churches in Muslim cities, organic church. You mentioned that book, uh, Missionary Biography. And I would recommend, always try to always, you know, be reading missionary biographies. Just it, it inspires you about, you know, their life and what God is doing. Uh, one book that I read recently that is kind of a modern uh, it's a modern, t it's a modern story. It's kind of a biography, but it's, it's more of a story of what this missionary was evaluating and what God is doing in Islamic West Africa. And so for us in the Islamic West Africa context, it's been a big help. And that book is called a wind in the house of Islam. Um, 
Now, some of the things you'll give and take, like any books, I think there's a disclaimer here, any books we recommend, obviously we may not be 100% theologically aligned, but even if I wrote a book, I may not be 100%, you know, aligned with it later. So, you know, it's just the way, the nature of it. So, but uh, that book definitely gives some great insight into the mindset of Muslims who get saved and then how they approach reaching their family members and how as a Western missionary, you can kind of understand that reality and approach it. Um, some other books that have really helped. Um, we are trying to develop, and we're going to start doing a two-week seminar every month or every other month on training young people, training anybody really who's interested in leading Bible studies throughout our country as we start doing our um, church planning. But one of the things that... I wanted to develop was a curriculum of teaching good sound doctrine and theology from an African mindset or a Middle Eastern mindset. So one thing I found in in Africa across the board from books I've read, missionaries I've talked to, and from my own personal experience is that generally... Christians from all denominational stripes are much more conservative and much more, um, I don't know what other words you would use, but they're, they, they, are much, they take the Bible literally, they take the Bible seriously. They're not liberal like you'll find in a lot of the major denominations, even though they might have different practices that we don't align with. Um, I'll give you an example. The Anglican Church in Nigeria is part of the reason why the Anglican Church of England has not yet um, allowed, maybe they have now, but this was a few years back, but they were not allowing uh, homosexual priests to be ordained because the Anglican Church in Nigeria and other countries in Africa was threatening to leave the denomination if they voted and allowed this because in Africa there's still a much stronger conservative uh, view, and I'm not using that word politically, like when it comes to believing the Bible, you know, and taking it seriously. And so, um, that being said, while there are very most denominations and Christians we encounter, the Christians are very serious. There's a dirge of good, sound understanding of doctrine and theology. And part of that, from what I studied and evaluated, was I think the approach that foreign missionaries took to teaching theology. I think that in a Western mindset, most systematic theologies are written by Western mindset, the Western mind, written by Westerners from Western culture. And there's a lot of advantages to systematic theology, but the Bible wasn't written as a systematic theology, right? And so I think systematic theology is a good box. It's a good structure, and you should be attached to a good structure in order to properly interpret Scripture. But it is still a human construct, right? The Systematic theology in general. And so what we found was a lot of the Africans we work with don't, they haven't been trained or their mindset is not the way that we as Westerners think. That's obvious, but when it comes to theology, we don't really translate that over. And so we wanted to come up with a way, how can we present scriptures and theology in really, I guess it's kind of a, in a narrative in the way that the Bible's written, because culture here in Senegal is much more closer to the culture of the New Testament and of the Old Testament, of the scriptures. And so we wanted to try to come up with a way to teach theology, not just as a system, the way you would line up, all right, let's take the doctrine of redemption, let's take the doctrine of atonement, and let's just systematize it and you know lay it out in a way that's understandable, a way that we can analyze. There's definitely advantages to that for sure, but to really reach, especially those who are uneducated, to understand that we wanted to get to a point where they can just open a Bible and any passage of scripture, they can be, they are equipped and ready to properly interpret and handle that passage of scripture to teach it properly. And so there's some books that really have helped as I've been, we've been trying to develop, we've, we've been writing out um, 
we have a curriculum we've been working on that goes through scriptures, kind of following the narrative of scriptures and letting theology um, develop as we go through the narrative of scriptures and each theme coming out. And there's been a few books. One of the books that I was recommended to read recently, and um, it was really well written. It's kind of been a great help as we're developing this theological approach of teaching is a book called He Will Reign Forever. Uh, The author is Michael Vlach. And um, it's called The Biblical Theology of the Kingdom of God. And um, he addressed, really, he goes from Revelation, Genesis to Revelation, um, just does a great job of letting theology develop from the text through the narrative of Scripture, not just you know, taking a topic and then systematically laying out what that topic, but how does, how does each theological point as it's presented in scripture relate to each other in the kingdom of God as it develops? And so, um, really good book, um, that I would highly recommend, uh, reading. And so, yeah, things like that. Uh, I, I was a missionary told me once, always challenge yourself, try to have, um, try to read a theology book with all the books you're reading. Always try to have a theology book at hand that you're reading through. And I try to read through theology books that of all different perspectives. I think it's important to read books that, um, that you disagree with so that you can kind of be confirmed in your own convictions, why I disagree with this. Um, and it can also shed light on maybe there's an area you, you don't understand that well, um, sometimes listening to somebody you disagree with will help shed light on how you don't really comprehend this aspect very well. And I'll say this before we finish up, and uh, you, I'll give you the final word there. The same is true, I think, with uh, Muslim learning about Islam. I get asked the question a lot, what books do you recommend about learning Islam? The first thing I would say is um, le- know, just know the New Testament know the scriptures, know the gospel, know the life of Jesus. Um, Just just saturate yourself, especially with the gospels, because if you understand the teachings of Jesus, the context of Jesus' teaching, um, the better you'll be equipped to respond to differing uh, attacks on Christianity or teachings of Christianity. Um, But my biggest recommendation for books on Islam, read as much as you can, read whatever you can find. Number one, I would say be careful of reading authors who are very critical of Islam. All right. There's a few books. Um, The gentleman who wrote the book, Peace Child, um, Richardson, Um, he wrote a book on Islam called, I think, Islamic Unveiled, or I I forget the title. And I read it. And while it was factually accurate, it was very, um, I wouldn't say condescending, but it was just the tone of the book was very condemnatory. And of course, Islam can save nobody. It's a work-based religion. But you don't want to go away from learning about somebody's faith and religion and just have this sense of superiority or obviously my faith is better than yours. Um, You want to be able to understand with compassion and empathy. Um, But I would also say, and this is hard to do, okay? This is a very hard discipline to practice. But if you truly want to understand what Islam is about and the mentality of of Islamic thinking, then my recommendation would be go to the source. Read Islamic literature from Islamic sources. Watch debates. Now, I'm not a big fan of doing debates. Um, We more enjoy doing forums where we let people ask questions and we answer their questions. But watch debates, Christian uh, Christian versus Muslim and Go on YouTube and watch debates. You know, if if the title is Muslim Destroys a Christian, usually I don't wa- like watching those because they pick some Christian who doesn't actually know a thing about the Bible. He doesn't know anything about theology and the Muslim apologist will just destroy them. I hate watching them, but they actually help give insight into the thinking and theology of, um, of the Muslim mind. And so there's a group here in Senegal. They go around basically attacking Christianity and trying to say that um, they're taking Islamic 
theology and imposing it onto the New Testament. And so they're saying, you know, Jesus was a Muslim and they'll take Bible verses and they'll twist the interpretation because they're taking an Islamic mind and they're uh, interpreting scriptures that way. And so I'll listen to them and then we'll give a response through our social media on what is, you know, what the actual truth is. But I found that a lot of Christians, they engage uh, here in Senegal, they don't know scriptures. So they, they, they are left dumbfounded when they twist the scriptures here. And so that's the biggest thing. If you're a missionary, don't just know theology. Don't just understand theology, but understand how people and Christians specifically in your culture understand their mindset, learn the way that people learn, and then try to approach teaching theology that way. And so Jesus used parables all the time to teach kingdom truth. We do that here because it's a story-based uh, society for people to learn. Uh, that's the way people think and learn. So we well, we use parables a lot. We use stories a lot. We use narrative a lot to teach theology, not just a systematic, you know, uh, analytical type approach. And so I would recommend continue, you know, always be reading theological books, but always try to gain insight into the way that people in your culture learn and perceive. And so that way that they can get you know, well-grounded and sound doctrine and be able to uh, defend their faith and also to, as the Bible says, convince the gainsayer and put to silence those who oppose themselves. And uh, those things are very important. Always be reading, engaging your mind uh, and just trying to grow. But always read, especially if they're Muslim books, uh, read with an open mind and try not to develop a, a spirit of... Um, Anger. Sometimes, you know, reading books about Islam can get you angry and upset. Um, but just try to be open and, and neutral when reading those books and then learn how to apply it when you're evangelizing uh, your Muslim friends and neighbors. Very excellent. These are some really great, um, really practical tools and things to consider. If you are maybe more further down the road of becoming a missionary or you are a missionary, especially with the possibility of ministering to Muslims. That's some great stuff. Well, Josh, as we conclude here, um, I put out a few weeks ago the suggestion and the request that some people kind of share with us some missionary biographies or books that have impacted their lives. And I just want to take a minute to really breeze through those and some ones we haven't mentioned yet today that still could be maybe a, a great influence and impact in someone's life. Uh, the person that's most important to me in my life after Jesus Christ is my sweet wife, Holly, who uh, has been uh, someone who's loved missions and missions biographies for many years. Uh, she wanted to uh, put out a few books there to consider. Evidence Not Seen by a lady named Darlene Dabler Rose. Amazing story about her life, yeah. I believe, in Africa. That's a great one that everyone should read. They need uh, to make Jungle a movie Pilot. about her life, Darlene Rose. It's cre mm -hmm. incredible, mm -hmm. incredible story. It's just amazing. But anyways, go ahead. <laughs> no, yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, Jungle Pilot, Life of Nate Saint by a gentleman named Russell Hitt. Uh, we've mentioned this gentleman. Uh, Amy Carmichael is another, I can't remember the name of the, story, the book, but she uh, has that book and has loved it, especially since uh, she was a single missionary. Um, there's just someone she mentioned, a friend of ours named Kyle Sheridan, who's uh, in Patagonia. He sent us a long list, but some of the ones that we haven't mentioned that are on his list, Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret, um, Borden of Yale. That's also another biography I read when I was young. That's a tremendous a testimony that encourages and inspires. Uh, Passion and Purity is another Elizabeth Elliot book we haven't mentioned, but it's terrific. Not really missions minded as much as just kind of talking about the mindset of a uh, servant of God. Uh, John G. Patton, Missionary to the Cannibals, another terrific one. This one uh, I'm definitely going to get. It's called The Three Mrs. Judsons. I'm sure that is a very interesting and fascinating book by Annabella Stewart. Answers to Prayer by George Mueller. I have read that one. It's a terrific one. And then this one I did a little research on. It's called Bob Hughes, An Extraordinary Life by Monroe Rourke. Uh, I haven't read it yet. I think it's very cheap on Kindle. I'll get it and read it. Just read the synopsis. Sounds very interesting. And sound a lot like the Frank Drown story in the sense of someone that probably most people don't know in mission circles, but 
lived an amazing life that impacted the world. And I think those are the stories that inspire even those who never become missionaries. A lot of times these stories inspire people to be faithful givers to missionaries and faithful prayer warriors for missionaries. So we encourage all to read these. I think Jacqueline Mead is that a sister-in-law. She recommended Kisses from Katie by Katie Davis. Uh, I believe it might be his family to Josh. And then a dear friend of ours, um, who, a former missionary here, Mike Doring, he recommended Jim Elliott's Journal, uh, another really terrific book. So thank you for everyone who sent requests in, ones that impacted. I want to add two quick addendums here. That uh, these are these are not books; these are movies. Um, one is a documentary uh, that is entitled. Two Hats by Andrew Garcia. It is a terrific documentary, my favorite missions documentary. It mostly centered on the day-to-day lives of the Brad Wells family who were serving in the time in Papua New Guinea. It's a short film, a little over an hour long, I believe, but it just really encapsulates many uh, issues of daily mission life as well as missions philosophy, uh, the fruit and missions. And this can be found on Amazon Prime for like $2 to rent terrific, very visually satisfying uh, because it's in a part of the world that just jumps out on the screen, but really encapsulates what missions life is like. And I think anyone who loves missions or interested in missionaries would really enjoy this one. It's called Two Hats and a terrific. And then lastly, a lot of times people are asking us about how to introduce missions or missionaries to our kids. And obviously books are one way, but another series I think we might've mentioned before, it's called Torchlighters. Uh, There's over 20 different cartoons of famous missionaries and and also Christian martyrs, you know, Gladys Allward, Jim Elliott, Corey Ten Boom, many others. A great way in our case, because it's translated in Spanish, a lot of times we'll have it even in the kids' class during missions conference. And just another way to get children uh, to understand what it's like to be a missionary and to give your all for the Lord. And so I hope some of these resources have encouraged you, Josh, anything you want to add before we conclude today? Yeah, I would just say there's one book that I recommend to anybody, uh, any young man, specifically young men who feel called to full-time ministry. Okay. Not just missions, but full-time ministry. And it's a book called the next step, finding your where in the call to go. And uh, I highly recommend it because I personally know the author. <laughs> I wrote it. <laughs> okay. So I, it's a self published book right now, but it ba- basically shares, you know, I share uh, kind of how God led us to Senegal, how we just randomly picked a country out of a hat, and uh, talks about the impact of, you know, some of these books I've read, how it impacted my mindset, and how that led me to just, and a friend of mine to just randomly pick a country and how God led us to Senegal. But it really lays out, and maybe we can have an entire podcast on this, um, talking about this topic. It lays out a, a really a, a conviction that I have that the mandate of the call of God, okay, the call to preach, that the mandate behind the call is the Great Commission, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And the premise of the book is this, basically. If the mandate to the call to preach is the Great Commission, and the Great Commission says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, then I believe every young man who senses the call to preach, the first question they should ask is not the assumption, where does God want me to pastor in America or the country where I'm called, you know, that I'm in when I received my call. But the question that should be asked by every young man who senses the call to full-time ministry to preach is, where on earth are there no preachers? I'm going to go there first. And if God doesn't want me there, he'll close the door and lead me to pastor, you know, maybe in America or Canada or wherever you're from. But I think if we started with the understanding that scriptures and the Great Commission is the mandate to our call. I think we'd see more missionaries uh, being sent out to the field uh, where the need is great. And so anyways, if that's a book you're interested, I can send a PDF copy to you. Uh, You can just contact us through Missionary Perspective Podcast. I can send a hard copy when I get back to the States. I'm actually working on uh, a Christian publishing company to publish it. And uh, almost there, I just waiting to see a response. But 
Anyways, so I just thought I'd throw that out there, a little bit of self-promotion there. Um, you got to do it, you know, since uh, it's a book we wrote. But anyways. <laughs> you you buried the lead. We're talking about missionary <laughs> books, and you haven't even sent me that book. This is, listeners, this is a surprise to me. So, Josh, why don't you uh, okay. the name of that, and so we all can, we can get a copy of that. Yeah, it's called The Next Step, Finding Your Where, uh, in the call to go. And it's about just how does a missionary decide where to serve? Um, what goes behind that process of making that decision? And so, um, I'll, I'll send you a copy. I think I got a PDF copy somewhere. I'll make sure you get a copy of that. I think it's on Kindle. You could probably look it up. I, I did put it on Kindle. So anybody who has Kindle subscription, I think it's free on Kindle. You could try to look it up. And then um, I'm going to actually, now that I got all my new equipment, I'm going to try to do an audio book of it. So that's available to people. And uh, anyways. Well, we just know one of our future podcasts, we'll have to have a sit down with the author. So anyway, listeners, you've got a lot of great resources here today. Uh, this has been one of the more enjoyable podcasts for me because these books really, I think, have helped shape me as I look back now, uh, even as I'm sitting down here and going through this list with Josh, there's more books that are just jumping to my mind that I'll just leave out if you want to know more. Um, but it's just amazing how the Lord uses testimonies of former missionaries, current missionaries uh, to shape our, our desire to serve him. And so please take time to know um, other missionaries through their stories, maybe they're centuries old or maybe more recent and contemporary. But the most underlying thing I would say of all, all, all these is these were just the same kind of people you and I are, sinners saved by grace, who did extraordinary things to the Lord because they were willing to go. And that's kind of what the point of the missionary perspective is to kind of uh, take away the hero-ness of being a missionary to the everyday life and how the Lord can use you. Uh, in his great and sovereign will. That's exactly it. And uh, missionary, just they're just ordinary people. We're just regular everyday people that God has given an extraordinary task to fulfill and uh, he equips you. And there's no doubt you, you get, you get inspired by the missionaries of the past. I get inspired by missionaries of the present, hearing their stories. And, and uh, you're right just talking about all these biographies, there's books coming to mind that I forgot I had even read, but uh, very important. Always be challenging yourself, always be seeking to grow and to uh, be mentored and learn. And when you're a missionary, especially if you're a missionary like us, where you're kind of in an isolated situation, there's not many other people around you, uh, good books can be good mentors, you know? And so, um, mm -hmm. you know, collect books and invest do online, whatever it takes, and uh, develop that missionary heart by getting your hands on good missionary books. And so, well, Eric, I really appreciate the time. It was really enjoyed talking to this topic. I look forward to next week and uh, continuing into this new year as we address more issues and missions from the missionary perspective. Great talk to you, Josh. Lord bless you and listeners. Please reach out. Uh, share the podcast. We love to get more people in this community of believers and missions minded people so we can uh, just encourage those who are thinking, considering missions, and those who are on the mission field. This is Josh from Senegal. Have a great day.